Uh, so hello. Uh, uh, it's really great to be here in person because up to this time I, I was experiences, uh, ex experiencing uh, Blender conferences uh, via a video stream, but no amount of video streaming can replicate those feeling of be being here. And yeah, uh, so I'll be talking uh, about a special kind of people, about people uh, who were photographers first, and then uh, they turned into uh, 3D artists. Uh, so I'd like to ask uh, how many of you uh, consider themselves uh, photographers? Please raise your, raise your hands. Oh, quite a few. Uh, so uh, how many of you consider themselves studio photographers that deal with lamps and modifiers? Not so many. Okay, I see two or three. Okay. Uh, so uh, as, I can, as I can see, for most of you it may be too late to start with photography and move to the uh, 3D graphics world, <laughs> uh, and your mind is already contaminated with all those tricks and shortcuts that 3D artists use uh, and uh, photographers have no idea about. Uh, and it's good, I would like to show you that it may be better. Uh, so yeah, uh, why photorealism? Uh, photorealism uh, is an important, highly sought after skill uh, because uh, many companies that uh, deal with physical items, uh, they can save money this way. They can replace those physical items with uh, generated uh, images and deal with this uh, cheaper. But those images have to be indistinguishable from the real photography. That's the hard part. And uh, for example, IKEA, everybody knows this company. They are producing furniture. Uh, and they, are, they have several tries uh, to uh, move to 3D ima ima images uh, from real photography. You probably know those beautiful catalogs of their furniture. Those, uh, those is really world-class photography. And uh, they tried and tried and they failed. And uh, it was not a technical problem. They were not lacking knowledge about shaders or materials or something like that. Uh, it was simply... Uh, they, they were simply lacking a uh, photographic touch. And uh, they uh, came up with the idea, idea to retrain their photographers as uh, 3D artists. And uh, it was a hit. 3D artists, artists uh, had no idea how to use all those tricks. Uh, so th they just approached uh, the virtual scene as, a, as, a, as they would in the normal studio. And uh, the results were great. And in fact, mm, they started uh, in 2012, when around 12% 12 uh, of their products uh, were computer generated, and next year uh, 25%, and the next the day after uh, around 75%. And what's so great about it, nobody noticed. Nobody noticed you are swapping beautiful photography with uh, cheap uh, computer Im imager. Uh, even in blind tests, uh, when they ask people uh, which one is, is which, is it a real photo or, or is it a computer-generated image, people were not able to, to tell and s frequently they uh, designated photos as a 3D graphics and the opposite. Um, so what, what is photorealism and what, uh, how it differs from just realism? So uh, it's not... Uh, showing the world like it is, like it, like real world, but uh, looking at the things like photographers do. And they uh, don't look w uh, at things with naked eye, uh, they look through the camera. So you have to be aware of, of certain qualities of uh, the image that camera produces, various lenses and so on. And the second, uh, maybe more important thing, it's that photographers uh, have control over light. And in case of uh, studio photography, they have almost total control of uh, the light, as opposed to, for example, uh, available light outside. And uh, what photorealism is not, definitely for me. Uh, all those uh, fake vignettes, uh, chromatic aberration, color grading, and so on, uh, those are the just um, post-processing tricks. Uh, and they are cheap, they look cheap, and they won't make your, your scene more photorealistic. Uh, if you cannot uh, make the scene photorealistic from the ground up, uh, this uh, thin layer that you lay in post-processing uh, won't help you much. 
uh, yeah. So uh, when you want to learn uh, how to make classy light, you have to back. You have to go back to film photography uh, before the age of digital camera, and especially before the age of Photoshop came, uh, because uh, in the age of digital camera. Uh, many photographers uh, have this approach to uh, let's shoot something and then we'll fix it in Photoshop. And uh, I think uh, it's not a good approach. Uh, so uh, you, you have to find uh, sources before that era to really uh, learn about proper lighting. Because uh, at that, that time uh, people shot uh, on film and film was expensive, especially for a large format cameras. Uh, one shot could cost several uh, dozens of dollars, for example, so you couldn't make 1,000 shots and select uh, something from that. And uh, what's so great about it is that you can uh, actually use books from the 19th century. For example, this book, uh, it's a handbook of practice uh, and art of photography, uh, and you can find valid tips about lighting in this book and use them in Blender. Uh, yeah, but uh, in fact, uh, I would like uh, to show you some more recent resources. Uh, for example, this book, uh, Light, Science and Magic, uh, it contains some fundamentals. If you want to know uh, about how to light things, this book uh, is absolute basics. Uh, they, can, they, they show you how cer certain materials behave. For example, uh, glass, metal, uh, diffuse materials and so on, and how to light them, how to use light to uh, separate them from, from the background, how to make glass look like glass and not, not plastic and so on. Uh, and this book uh, will speak to the inner geek of you because there are many diagrams uh, and some physics involved. Uh, but it's uh, pretty uh, basic knowledge. Uh, and the next step you can take to teach yourselves uh, is to find uh, book, books from the uh, Pro Lighting series, and again, uh, the older the better. Uh, this one is from 1992, so uh, as you know, Photoshop was uh, published in probably 1990, uh, but uh, it took some years for this disease to spread. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this book is definitely from the time before Photoshop, and uh, it's about uh, food photography, but they also have others, other topics. But food, food photography is, is uh, um, particularly hard to make. Uh, so this book uh, contains, as opposed to the previous book, uh, it contains not uh, just a basic uh, uh, knowledge, but uh, specific situations. You have uh, specific food and how, the, how, the, how that was shot, uh, how the light was positioned uh, to, for example, minimize reflections or, or to add reflections, uh, and so on. And so they are uh, mostly pre-digital era books, and uh, you can use uh, back issues of Vogue. And uh, what's interesting, uh, we won't be looking for uh, photos of models there, but at adver advertisements. Uh, I know that this sounds crazy to buy uh, uh, a magazine just to look at advertisements, uh, but uh, they are mostly great examples of, of grey light. Uh, there are advertisements of uh, really expensive products, high quality <laughs> products, high end products, and they hire very expensive photographers to shoot them. So they know what they are doing. And if you uh, browse through this magazine, you will find uh, Many excellent examples like uh, fragrance ads, jewelry ads, watches ads. Uh, and if you buy some issues from uh, early 90s or even early 2000s, they are not so distorted by Photoshop like the later ones. Uh, yeah. So it's a great ins inspiration. And uh, what I would like to uh, talk uh, today is uh, precision lighting. Not just every light, uh, but uh, the light that is tailored specifically to the specific uh, situation or a specific subject. And uh, that assumes that you know what kind of light is appropriate for, uh, for in this situation or that situation. So it's probably not possible to come to the solution just by guesswork or trying, trial and error and so on. 
Uh, so what light can we use in 3D world? Um, maybe HDRI or uh, image-based lighting is the answer. And uh, some people love it, you know, because it promises uh, easy results instantaneously. Uh, but I think uh, it's not the way. And uh, apart from the uh, obvious shortcomings of it, uh, like uh, all the lights are placed at infinity. You know, all the lights are the same distance from the subject, and uh, it's in certain situation it matters. For example, in outdoor scene, it mostly doesn't matter because uh, because sun or other uh, light sources are so away that they essentially at infinity. But in studio or in closed spaces, uh, it does matter, and uh, it can uh, ruin your shot. And the second thing about it. Uh, is that HDRI is really not so uh, easy to set up properly. It's not just the matter of slapping it to the DOM and rendering. Uh, it requires certain amount of skills to set it properly. Um, yeah, like uh, this uh, example from fxguide.com. Uh, here is uh, a solution that uh, industrial light and magic uses uh, with their uh, film production. Uh, they shot uh, 360 image over surrounding, and then uh, instead of just slapping this HDRI image to, to the dome, they are separating uh, lights and recreating them as a mesh objects. Uh, so when, for example, the car moves, it can move between the area of one light to the area of other lights to the second light, because uh, without that, uh, the light uh, won't change. Uh, but all those uh, technical shortcomings, uh, for me, are not the most important. Uh, for me, uh, the most dangerous thing about HDRI is that uh, it's magic, and uh, it prevents true learning and understanding how uh, light work, works. And uh, in fact, in studio shots, uh, we can use uh, HDR lights, uh, but not as a main uh, light source, but just as, uh, as at, at one percent of, or, or maybe something uh, like that, uh, to make shot more uh, photorealistic and less, less sterile. If you use only uh, lamps, uh, it will lack something. Uh, so the good uh, good thing about uh, working in a virtual studio is that uh, it's easier to shot uh, in, uh, than in the uh, real studio. Uh, for example, you can make your lights invisible and while uh, you're working in a, a real studio, you will be constantly fighting to hide your lights from the shot. Sometimes you need a backlight or something like that uh, and it's sometimes really hard to hide this light. And it's in 3D world, it's just a simple click and you hide it. And for example, camera is also invisible. Uh, in real studio, sometimes uh, we have to cut a hole in a white cardboard just to hide the camera. Uh, and uh, you don't have to do this in virtual studio. And uh, like <laughs> in my case, I, I'm mostly shooting uh, uh, models like girls. Uh, so they are uh, emotional. They are they're human, uh, and working with them is sometimes uh, really time consuming, and uh, working in, with virtual uh, objects, virtual girls, is really a uh, little easier. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as for lights and virtual studio, uh, the great thing is that they can have any shape, and don't be afraid to use all kinds of shapes of lights. Uh, not just squares or circles. Uh, sometimes the situation demands that you uh, shape your light according to the shape of the objects. Uh, it's a one-off solution, but sometimes it's the better solution. And uh, also don't be afraid to add gradients to your lights uh, because uh, it makes your lights more flexible and adds uh, just a tiny bit of photorealism to the scene because uh, even in real studio, uh, no lights are perfect. No, no lights have uh, 
perfect emission from every centimeter uh, of the plane. So adding uh, gradients really help. Uh, when I was uh, working with Blender, I asked myself, uh, can real life studio uh, lights be recreated inside uh, a 3D software? So I uh, made an experiment and I took uh, the, one of my favorite lights. It's a beauty dish. It's, it's used mostly in fashion photography uh, to shoot models. And uh, I took it, uh, placed it uh, in front of me and just uh, recreated it in uh, Blender. So as you can see, uh, it's an indirect uh, light source. Uh, all uh, the, the light, uh, flashlight, is hidden because, uh, af um, behind this cup. And uh, the only light that reaches the subject is the light that is scattered around this, uh, uh, this shape. Uh, so the light that reaches your subject is just uh, uh, bounced light. And when I tried this uh, in cycles, it took uh, several hours to render and the result was still noisy. Uh, so uh, it's not good uh, approach. But after a few days of thinking about it, uh, I came up with a solution to just uh, bake the lights. Uh, uh, excuse me, this lousy uh, UV unwrapping, but it was just a quick proof of concept. When you bake a combined pass on such uh, a light, uh, it becomes direct light and it renders instantaneously and the results are pretty great. So just, uh, just a tip, if you want to recreate uh, some modifiers or, or some uh, lamp heads inside Blender. And uh, when I was talking uh, with some of you uh, before my presentation, somebody asked, uh, so what camera should I buy or what lenses, what flash heads and what equipment to teach myself this uh, studio photography? And uh, I would say, uh, don't do it because it's very expensive, uh, it is time consuming, uh, it, it will dry, drain your resources like, like crazy. Uh, because it's, it's very expensive stuff. And uh, the better way is just to rent a studio. In most big cities, there are several uh, studios to rent. Uh, you can rent a studio, you can rent a camera, uh, even uh, sometimes they will give you an assistant to operate all those uh, equipment if you have no idea how to do it yourself. And it costs the, probably dozens of dollars per, per hour, so uh, it's a better way just to uh, get married to your equipment forever. And uh, to teach yourself uh, about photography and, uh, yeah? Ah, oh, five minutes. Okay, uh, we have five minutes left. Uh, uh, one way to teach yourself uh, about photography uh, is to copy photographs. And uh, for example, uh, I, uh, when I was a kid, I, find, I found uh, this photograph. Uh, this is a render by me, but it's based on a photograph from 1990, uh, when the Commodore company released a CDTV multimedia computer, and they have, uh, they, they, then they had still money, and they uh, could allow a professional photographer to shoot this. And uh, I always liked this uh, scene, so I wanted to uh, shoot this in the studio, but I didn't have this computer. Uh, so uh, I was thinking about finding somebody and, and renting this computer. But uh, one day I heard uh, about cycles and I did a quick test, uh, just, uh, just a CPU uh, portion of it. I just recre recreated in it it in Blender, uh, and I had, at that time, I had no idea about lighting in cycles. I just did it like I, like I would it in the real studio, and for me, the result was amazing, and it was in instantaneous. Uh, so I proceeded with this project and rebuilt uh, all the uh, different parts, and I learned a lot uh, about lighting this way. Uh, 
let's take a look at uh, one example of the light, uh, of the precision lighting I was talking about earlier. Uh, for example, uh, I made this uh, a few months ago. Uh, it took me like uh, three days of hard work. Uh, I collected uh, many reference images uh, of advertisements, of phones, uh, and so on. Uh, and I uh, wanted it to look like a high-end, expensive product. Uh, yeah. So, uh, how, did, how do you think? How many lights are there in the scene? One or two, maybe? Or three? You, you can see, for example, uh, here, uh, the mesh light with a gradient, and maybe second there, but what about other lights? So, uh, when you want to uh, light something with precision, you have to care about every reflection and every edge uh, separately. So it looks like this. Uh, it's 11 lights, actually, and uh, even 12 or 13 if you count that uh, the screens of phones are also light sources and they are glowing. Uh, yeah. And apart from lights, there are some things that uh, photographers use in the studio. They are very useful and they are flags. And in this situation, uh, this big rectangle that is directly mm, behind the phone uh, is a flag. And uh, as I said earlier, uh, it's easier to do uh, in the virtual studio than in the real one because you can make your flag invisible. If I would do this uh, in the real studio, it would obscure my uh, background. And this way, uh, background is visible to the camera, but the light from all those 11 light sources here is not uh, spilled onto the background. And uh, as you can see here, oh, excuse me, uh, there is a gradient on the background and it was not added at the post production stage. It is all done in camera. Uh, and the second example, uh, I wanted to show you that. Uh, uh, you don't need to have several lights all the time. Uh, for example, this scene is only one light, uh, or to be precise, two, but the second light is very small. Uh, it looks like this. There is a, a gradient light uh, uh, above it, and just a small rectangle of light uh, to, make this, uh, to make this edge more pronounced. You can compare this without this light and with this light, it makes a difference. And sometimes those are the uh, details that make your uh, photography stand out and your 3D graphics too. And uh, unfortunately, you have, how much time do we have? Yeah, we can continue. Okay, uh, so I prepared some uh, examples uh, not made by me. For example, this is a graphics made by Shimon uh, from uh, our forum. And uh, our forum uh, is run by Piotr Arukovic, uh, a really charismatic leader. Yeah, please, uh, a round of applause for him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, he is uh, able to attract many uh, young people and teaches them about Blender. For example, this is made by uh, forum member Shimon, and he made uh, this scene. He asked me uh, what can he improve here about light, uh, and I wanted to show you that uh, you can find great light not only in photography. Uh, if you are a photographer, you will spot great light everywhere, not only in photography. For example, in uh, concept art, and I collected for him some concept arts, and uh, what we can immediately see here is that this, uh, uh, this object that uh, Blacksmith is working on is glowing, and it's, it's casting light on his, on his face, and in this uh, photo it's glowing, but it's not casting any light, so he will have to fi fix that. And uh, the second important thing uh, are the edges, the edges of objects separate, uh, this light of, on the edges separates objects from the background and is very important and it's also lacking in this photo. Uh, and I also wanted to show you that, uh, to show him that uh, blacksmith doesn't work with his hand only but with his whole body. 
so he uh, so he uh, started to fix that and this is the first version and you can immediately see that uh, the results are better uh, the lights the rim light separates the subject from the background uh, and uh, thing that the blacksmith is working on uh, produces some light and uh, result is better and there are still some uh, things that are lacking here uh, because there, this is a night scene probably uh, so we would uh, we would have to work uh, with color on this scene uh, but if you take a look at, at some ref reference material uh, we can see that uh, in most film and photographs a night is not black or gray uh, the night uh, is actually blue and if it's contrasted with uh, uh, yellow light uh, we can see that the action takes place, place at night and uh, on this concept art uh, too we can see this uh, this contrast so if you want if you wanted to improve this work by Shimon by Shimon Steel uh, we would have to uh, make the night blue and add some yellow probably to this light coming from the fire and it would be uh, obviously better. Oh, do we still have time? Okay, uh, we can proceed because I, I prepared, actually my presentation, I prepared it uh, a little longer that, than my time slot, but maybe if nobody has anything about uh, against it, uh, we can proceed uh, with special purpose lenses. Uh, those are uh, uh, another tools that you can use in Blender and uh, are not so frequently used, uh, used uh, as they should be. Uh, for example, when we want to photograph uh, architecture, uh, we are standing at the street level and uh, we cannot uh, we cannot see the top of the buildings at our photograph. So what do we do? Usually we raise our camera and the buildings uh, start to converge and they look like they're like falling down. So what can we do uh, about it? Uh, we can raise our uh, point of view, but uh, it's not the effect that you wanted to achieve. You wanted to, to show this building from the street level. So photographers, in this case, uh, use so-called uh, shift lens. Uh, and in Blender, you can replicate this effect by using those uh, shift values uh, beneath focal length. Uh, so for example, I shifted this image on the y-axis uh, a bit, and it's still on the street level, but the uh, vertical lines uh, are straight. Uh, and uh, what you can learn from photography is also that not our cameras are uh, equal when it comes to sensor size. And in the old times, it was called film size, of course. Uh, and in Blender, probably everybody is using just standard sensor size. Uh, it's 32 on this uh, screenshot. But if, if you worked with cameras and a different sensor size, uh, you could learn that uh, depth of field effect is vastly different on different sensor sizes. If you use medium format camera that has sensor uh, 60 by 60 millimeters, uh, the depth of field be, will be uh, different and some of those uh, high quality ads from Vogue were shot with medium format cameras or even large format cameras. So if you uh, try to replicate this look uh, with Blender and you wouldn't know about this value, uh, you would fail for sure because uh, the depth of field would be different. So it's a good, uh, good thing to know. Uh, and to be honest with you, there are some uh, disadvantages of the approach that I just show you. Uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, not good uh, when the camera angle changes or if there is a uh, movement in the scene. Uh, because all those handcrafted reflections uh, are gone when you move just a, f a few, uh, just by a little angle. Uh, so what to do in this situation? Uh, and my answer is that I don't know because I am a photographer and you need a cinematographer for that. 
So maybe uh, next year uh, we'll have some, somebody that was working on a real film set and he will show us uh, how to do this when this something moves. So, uh, for example, I made this uh, scene and uh, then the client approaches me uh, that he wants to have this uh, image on the, um, on the label of his, of his CD, but he wants some slight, slight changes, like changing the angle of the car, uh, making the logo bigger, of course, uh, and so on. Uh, but after I did this, uh, I lost uh, the handcrafted reflection and all of, of those, uh, um, all of that I worked on uh, because the camera angle or something in the scene changed and I had to change manually all 25 lights. So it's, uh, so, uh, it's not good, it is, this approach is not, uh, not perfect when something moves and when you have a lot uh, of material to shoot, like for example pack shots, you have catalog uh, with thousands of items and if you would uh, uh, tailor your light to the subject, to every subject, you would lose a lot of time. But for a high-end ad, when you have single object and you want to have something different and special for this object, uh, this is the way to do. Uh, and I want uh, to uh, end my presentation with a quote uh, from this book that I showed you from 19th century, uh, that the beautiful uh, is difficult. Uh, because um, uh, if you start uh, thinking about your scene uh, with photography in, in mind, uh, you won't need to fix it uh, later with post-processing uh, tricks. And photography, especially uh, studio photography, is a difficult subject, uh, so uh, don't take shortcuts and uh, don't pretend that you're lighting experts and don't call your... Uh, HDRI uh, maps collection pro lighting because they are not, and maybe you are mis misleading uh, your clients. Uh, yeah, so that's it. Uh, it was a pleasure to, to talk uh, to you today, and I hope to see you next year. Thank you. Masz wolne na razie. Dobra, idę się rozerwać.